enjoy it and have beer. Sponsored by White Plum and right. 50 beers. Are there 50? Not now. Not now. Right. Uh, Not I'm now. Jason Brooks from Declara. Uh, I thought I would just give a uh, pretty simple overview of what directives are. Uh, uh, how to use a simple version of them and a few problems we've had with directives at Declara. Um, <laughs> uh, what is a directive? Directives are reusable web components. A uh, small piece of HTML with some JavaScript behind it that you can drop on one or more pages. Um, a lot of times when you start learning Angular, uh, the answer you find is directives are where jQuery goes. And that is actually true, <laughs> but you shouldn't ever really use jQuery with Angular. Uh, Bad things happen all the time. Uh, never works correctly. And jQuery is really a crutch if you're using Angular. You, you don't ever really need to do it. So. Uh, some, some properties in directives. Uh, you have restrict, AEC. Uh, that, that tells the directive what kind of attribute you, it will accept. Uh, uh, sorry, attributes, you know. Uh, I'm going to use a blink tag for, for an example. So uh, attribute be blink equals true. Element would actually be a new HTML element, blink, and class. And you can say class equals blink. Um, and that will, tr that will trigger the directive in Angular. Uh, template is the HTML that will be used for the directive you're implementing. Uh, <coughs> I'll go into this a little bit later, but you can also use template URL and have a separate HTML file for your uh, template. Uh, that makes, especially when you have a large directives file, that makes things a lot cleaner and easier to read. You don't have a giant block of HTML that's just a, that need a JavaScript string that can be 50 lines long and have tons of logic in it. Replace is <coughs> whether you want uh, to replace the HTML inside the directive or uh, make the directive contain the HTML you're, you're putting inside. Uh, scope, you can have an isolated scope, which will not let you have access to its parent scope, or you can inherit the parent scope. Uh, and I'll go, go into that a bit later. Uh, transclude is whether you want to pass through the information uh, HTML inside the directive. And link is the function that will let you modify the scope and put that into the HTML template. Uh, this is going to get a little awkward. <laughs> yeah, Mauricio gets to move. <laughs> you try. You guys do I'm gone. Pretty much. Okay. All right, let's see. Oh, yes. I implemented a blink tag. <laughs> uh, all the old people in the, in the room will remember you used to be able to do a blink in HTML and it would obnoxiously flash text over and over again in an infinite loop. I've also implemented a red tag, which does something equally easy. Can we maybe increase the font size? <coughs> maybe. Does the font text support that? Line. Yeah, yeah. You can use command, <coughs> command plus. Not in sublime text. Okay. Oh, yeah, okay. There we go. Okay. There we go. <laughs> so, you can see I've got blink and red. I'll do the same thing to chrome because that's probably also. All right, does pretty much re what you'd expect from the tags I put in. Uh, blink is just blinking text, and I just turned the text red. How I did that. All right, so I'll start with the first one. Uh, blink, 
Uh, you can see I restricted it to an element, uh, and I have the blink element there, so we're going to replace it. Transclude past the text through. Um, and you do have to add this ng transclude to the to the span so so it can replace the inside with what's what's in the tag in the HTML page. Um, I've got a controller. Uh, you're using Angular. I mean, it's just a controller. Uh, I've got a function show element, hide element, and then call call the loop. Uh, the template just HTML inside a string. Uh, I didn't put this in a separate HTML file like I recommend because I'm just running this off the uh, the file system. So you get cross scripting errors if you uh, try to do that without an actual server running. And replace, I actually replace uh, the blink tag with the span. So if you look, uh, I've just got span that's blinking. Mm -hmm. Span's red. But if I if I take this off, refresh, it leaves a blink tag around it. Um, occasionally, you might want that to happen, but that can break older browsers having HTML elements that don't actually exist. Um, I also heard that replace is going to be going away. Um, oh yeah, I saw a note when I was in there, so looking at something that they sort of mentioned that it might be deprecated. So, oh, okay. So what will the new behavior be when it's deprecated? I don't know. Oh. I don't know. I just saw it and I was like, oh, that's nice. So. <laughs> Uh, see directives. I have restricted it to an element again. Transcluded it. So I've got a link function in this one instead of a controller. Um, you can see that uh, link takes scope element element adders, uh, and with elm you can bind to events in Angular, um, avoiding jQuery again, uh, and change the CSS to red and transclude. Um, What's your choice between controller and link there? Is there a particular reason you chose controller at the top and yes, not link? Yes, I was going to use an example later. Okay. <laughs> Jumping ahead. But good question. <laughs> um, so uh, you can run into some problems if you try to chain directives inside the templates. I'm fairly certain that this will throw in here. Sorry, console getting there. But you can easily avoid that kind of thing by not replacing the element, maybe. Second red is not oh, second red. No, no. You? I don't know. Yeah. No. no. Use blink. Yeah, so if we want to. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that would be. <laughs> a little recursive. The main problem there. And so now, no, you can chain chain them together if you don't replace it. Um, should you be chaining directives together? That can end badly as well. <laughs> Uh, you can easily attain the same thing by doing it in HTML instead of the templates. Um, I just undo everything I did. And I think I still have to remove the replace, but yeah, but that's not showing it. So. Anyway, uh, that's bad form. Um, <laughs> um, okay, so as someone mentioned, uh, I've got controller in here, and I could easily attain the same thing with a link tag. Uh, 
um, but I left it in here because testing uh, directives can be a pain. Um, they're they're kind of out there on their own. Um, and as you can see, all the, all the code's buried inside a directive. Uh, there's not, they don't easily hook up to testing tools like the, the other Angular elements. What you can do is something like this. put it in a controller. So if you do it this way and call the controller via the link function, you can have uh, an actual directive controller that then you can hook into your current unit tests um, and get a lot better test coverage, not, not worry about code hiding out inside a directive, inside a template, um, that kind of thing. You get one controller instance per objective. Yes. In the DOM. Yep. Uh, do you get access to to the attributes and all the other stuff that the link has access to uh, in the controller? <coughs> Only if you pass it in. Um, if you look, all I'm doing here is calling an init function and passing it the element, and I catch it up there. So if you if you wanted uh, access to the attributes. Um, and the scope, you'd have to pass it in there, similarly. So, would it be worth to say if you need access to, to those attributes, it might be worth it to, to use link instead of controller? Could that be the, the parameter? Or to decide uh, what code to put in the controller, what code to put in the link? Maybe. Um, I, I was just using that, using it that way, so uh, it would be easier to do the unit test rather than make a generic function. Who knows what? And have a magical number of parameters that could or could not go in. Uh, so, <coughs> problems. Directives can be very long. Um, uh, uh, one of one of the propensities for developers is to make reusable tools as soon as they start using Angular, and you end up with some very uh, robust controllers, short pages, and a ton of directives. Um, that, um, you, you can start breaking those into modules, uh, but really using template URL instead of template can really shrink up a lot of that stuff because it takes all the HTML out of the JavaScript file. Uh, Dry is good. Uh, you never want to repeat yourself, but you can end up with uh, components that get reused too much. Uh, I declare we have a tile view control that is used on the feed list view, uh, in the admin control, in the forums, in the network. Uh, it has buttons and uh, text that only display in one of those places. The template for it is incredibly long. Um, and it, it's just hard to use and nobody wants to touch it. And there's no reason that couldn't be 510 directives instead of one giant directive that no one knows how to or wants to use. <laughs> um, always use open close tags. Uh, occasionally directives will fail if you just use like blink space slash close. Um, doesn't happen regularly, but it does happen. So it's easier just to always open close. And like I said, they're pain in this test. You can, you can let, like I showed, uh, make controllers and test the controllers separately, but they're, they're kind of locked out from the, from the rest of the Angular world. And I don't know, I haven't, I haven't kept up with the newest version, but, and there might be a better way to test directives now, but. But I haven't seen a good way to test them. And that's it. What specific okay. problems have you run into uh, with testing directives? Uh, just, just there's not, not a good way to do it. Some, some things are in the compile, fun compile function, some things are in the link function. Uh, I just don't know 
as some some like I showed there that have been chained together. Um, so you don't yeah, like just use fixtures and events to trigger those? Uh, no, we don't. We don't use that. That would be nice, but our UI is kind of in flux all the time. So. What was that? Uh, if that was adequate. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, now. Angular JS tab on your developer tools. Was oh, uh, that's battering. Uh, that's that's clo uh, Chrome's uh, or, or Google's Chrome Angular developer tool. It's like the uh, attribute selector, but for scopes. Then, if you want the little red lines, yeah, it's the show scope third one down. Ah, there we go. Okay, <laughs> console there actually that's prevented. We still those red things. Hold on. There we go. <laughs> I'm sorry, I forgot your name. To ben? Ben? Yeah. I mean, if you're pretty familiar with this tool, this I mean, have you found this to like add value to your development? Because I have yet to see this thing really. Uh, I have found it to add little to no value for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's just me. Uh, trying to find out what's, because like in our page, we have a lot of scopes. Yeah. Potentially more than we need, I don't know performance-wise, what's a good number of scopes to have, but we have a lot of scopes, and when, you know, it's something wrong maybe with the uh, the DOM and how I, it's I, highlighted. I, I, th I think it might be because I'm loading it from the file system. And not yeah, not um, and it's enabled and disabled on the screen, so right. who knows how the thing's handling it. But, you know, there's red lines everywhere. Using the inspector to find it, you can look to see what's on the scope, but in my opinion, putting a breakpoint inside your control or looking at the scope is a lot faster Totally. and actually tells you what you're doing. So I I was hoping that someone else would show me how to use this better. <laughs> That's why I asked you. The, <laughs> the, the other option, you can um, find an element, you can select it on, mm -hmm. on yeah, the, def yeah, on you can the actually use and then you can use console and you can output the scope that way. Yeah, you just do like dollar angular dot element dot scope or once you have the element inspected. Yeah. Yeah. And that'll tell and you the scope for that element and then you can walk the parent. Yeah, I just—I guess I've always just done that by inserting the breakpoint and mm -hmm. looking at the object itself. It's interesting though to go through and see the nesting um, in mm -hmm. battering and sort of get a feel for what's really happening uh, under the covers. Yeah, when it works, you'll see thousands of objects yeah. that are being a huge tree yeah. where you know, like one time I was looking at, it, I saw that you know, like we're creating you know an intermediate scope for no apparent reason. You know that was you know we could clean up and stuff. So I mean it was interesting to a point to see the tree diagram, but when I'm actually looking at an issue, I haven't yet seen it provide issue for debugging. But maybe someone else has, and I'm using it wrong. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the only time I've ever really used it uh, was in production before we had our source mapping set up, and all our angular was minified, mm -hmm. and I and I couldn't set a breakpoint. Uh, then I then I brought this up in the mm -hmm. inspector and found the element. It's good to have a general view of all the scopes, though. I had a situation where I had to destroy, I ended up needing to have to destroy my scope once in a while, because it just kept propagating more and more and more and more and more. And, more. and I wouldn't have really known it unless I actually looked at it the better. I'd love to hear some opinions on when people think there's a, a clear-cut choice to make a directive rather than just use like ng include. 
I feel like we've had this discussion a time or two, but um, maybe I'm just lazy, but there's a time, uh, sometimes where it seems like making a directive seems like there's a lot of overhead to it versus maybe not. Maybe it's not that much overhead. Yeah, I, I think the big uh, choice there is if you're going to use it somewhere else. And, and whether, it, whether it needs to tie to its parent scope or not. Well, I think NG include kind of solves that problem though too. I mean, yeah. you can reuse the same template with NG include, but I would say just the okay. amount of complexity. Like, what is the problem you're trying to solve? If you start to, if you need to like incorporate logic, if you need to talk to some kind of backend service, I mean, you can't do that by NG including something. Yeah, now but just static HTML and NG include is probably a lot simpler. Oh, absolutely. Than, than you know a directive, but as soon as you start to have to do logic. And manipulate inside of a link function or a dynamic compilation. Use compile, then I think a directive is where you want to go. Because an ng include is just a simple directive. When you can attach a controller to, you know, something that's you ng included. Mm -hmm. Well, in but that case, uh, that comes back to what you were hitting on, and it becomes less portable because with a directive you can just drop it in, right? right. But with ng include, then you have to make sure that you're bringing in the proper controller and the, uh, and your controller has to add it. a certain scope or object or function on the scope and it's an well, implicit there different contract files that all serve the same purpose a directive would. Basically you're making a decoupled directive at that point in time. So. You also have to read the source inside the ng uh, include. You have to look in the HTML, you have to figure out okay, what exactly, what scope is being referenced here versus if you look at a directive you can basically, especially if you're using an isolated scope or whatever, you can you can look at that scope um, element or uh, item on the the definition, know exactly what what parts of the um, scope you need to pass in. Well, I've heard Roger kind of say um, that it also is, I guess, the more declarative way to write. You know, something. You know, hopefully, by looking at what the um, directive is, you kind of get an idea of what it does. And, um, it might be a nice way to just to read the information. Anything else? So we have 15 minutes left. I'll let someone else go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I'm Matt Messenger. I am at messenger i did not introduce myself last week or last time we were here. Um, I'm Matt Messenger. I work at HP. Um, the web app that we're working on is kind of a, a collaboration between a bunch of HP engineers and a bunch of Wirestone engineers. Uh, Stan back there is from Wirestone, and he helps us. Or as, he's as much as a part of the team as, as the HP folks. Um, and we've been building basically a storefront application. Um, unfortunately, I can't go into much more detail than that, other than it's a store. <laughs> um, it's a medium scale project with about 30 engineers. Um, well, 30, 30 people. There's a lot of managers. <laughs> There's like five or six engineers. Not as busy. Our back end is Spring, and we basically moved to Angular JS. Um, when did I put it there? January, about January. Um, we were uh, JSP entirely. We're kind of learning Angular. Um, the idea of this meetup was pretty pretty sweet for us because we basically have made a bunch of decisions like, do we use ng-include or do we use directives? Um, and we didn't really have a clear-cut answer. A lot of times when you look on Stack Overflow, you might kind of get an answer to a particular problem, but you don't necessarily understand theory or best practices. And nobody wants to go and read a giant book. I mean, some people do. You, you probably have. <laughs> Ian did. Yeah, yeah. We know some people who go and read a book, we don't. We just kind of learn from our mistakes. So, um, so that's kind of some background. Uh, so why directive? So when our team first started out, um, maybe because we were lazy or maybe just because it was easier for us to understand, we kind of started with doing a bunch of controllers, a bunch of templates. Um, and we found ourselves very quickly copying and pasting controller code over and over and over again. Um, and while controllers were easier to test, um, kind of originally, um, the duplication of code was getting completely out of, out of hand. Um, and uh, so we started to look at controllers. We weren't doing a lot of DOM manipulation that I can remember. Um, so I mean, a lot, the second reason to use directives is because you, you're, you're messing with the DOM directly. You know, you have that element. Um, uh, access. Uh, we didn't really do a lot of that, but it was mostly just that that reusability. Um, I put testability here 
a little bit just because it was fewer tests. It was kind of like once we had the directive, but I loved your example with controllers. We're totally going to use that. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. Uh, we also want to inf uh, enforce um, good code behavior, not necessarily programmer behavior, but we want our code to act a certain way. And sometimes we could do that implicitly with, uh, with some directives. And we'll show an example here later with form. Um, we want all of our forms to like go disabled when you're actually when you hit the submit button and it's going into the server. We want to make sure that form was disabled, and we didn't want some programmer to have to know to do some special logic in their controller or whatever every single time that they submit a form. We just want to say, well, in our application, every form is going to do this and this and this, and so we we took that form, um, you know, element that tag, we made a directive on it, and we had a bunch of logic on it. So now every single form does that same thing. So. We wanted to enforce it there, and then explicitly as well. There were certain patterns. We always want to make sure that alerts were done a certain way. Um, and so Jared will show an example later about how we, we built in this alert directive. And now throughout our entire system, if you want to throw an alert on the page, this is, you know, you would use this directive. Um, and then finally, just, yeah, I guess the reusable thing for send feedback. So I think that was. Oh yeah, and so we had a, just a few rules and patterns. So then, okay, we made the decision we were going to start making doing directives, but then everybody sort of had a different interpretation on how they were going to implement it. And um, sometimes it was just based on the Stack Overflow example they saw. Um, other times it was just because that's the, the way it was on the Google documentation, and maybe that wasn't even right. So we just had a few basic rules to start, and there's probably, I'm sure people in, this, in the audience could probably add to this list, but we had a few, like directive naming. We append HP to all of our directives. I mean, obviously, um, if you were to open source this or want to you know, throw it out there in the world, um, namespaces kind of help. If everybody had one called graph, you know, there's so many different graph templates or directives. If, if everybody just called it graph, we'd be in trouble. So there's, you know, people, people add their own thing. We add our own. Also, if you're just looking through our templates, if you see, or HTML, um, if you see HP, you know it's our directive. Uh, we actually do the same thing with modules. I just kind of threw that in there. Just kind of a good practice. Um, we restrict all of our attributes in most cases to, to A. We use restrict A. We don't use classes. Um, on rare occasions, will we use elements, like I said earlier, when we do form, that would be an example of an element. I mean, you have to use E because it's a native element that we're trying to, 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 to control. Um, Another reason to use A, you can have multiple directives on one, on one element. So you can stack them like we saw with blink and red earlier. If you were to just, well, you did it within, the, within them, but you could easily just say div, red, um, blink. You know, you could start stacking the attributes and pretty soon um, you, you, know, you can kind of, you have lots of control um, on that one element. Plus it makes IE happy by default. There's shims and other things you can use to make IE accept having an element that's not um, not per the HTML spec, but uh, it's just easier to just do it that way. And then finally, um, we recommend always using, almost always using isolated scope. There's a few instances that we'll, we'll I think you even have an example where we don't use an isolated scope, but it's just, it just um, prevents you know, un, unwanted behavior. If you're using a directive and all of a sudden something changes on your scope and you don't know why, that's that leads to bugs, right? And so, if you're explicitly calling in and saying, um, you know, this is the, this is the scope and these are the parameters that I'm giving you to reference um, or manipulate, that's that's just better um, better practice. So, any questions on that? I'd be very interested if other people have some just basic rules that they follow, um, and maybe we can talk about that later too. You're up. Okay. <clears throat> so. Uh, the rest of this is, is kind of some examples of some things we've learned, uh, some specific use cases, and then also just kind of some patterns that we've started to follow, and this is a great example of, of one. So we wanted a feedback directive, uh, so we could throw just a feedback text area on any page, and uh, we could submit it, and potentially we might submit it to a different um, endpoint on the server, we might submit it with adding different data, like this one says include email address, but we wanted it to be reusable anywhere. Um, we found what we needed is that the data that's collected by the directive needs to be passed back to whoever is actually, you know, wherever this is defined. So this is our feedback directive, and this is going to be in some 
a HTML page somewhere, and that's going to be inside some controller. And that controller kind of needs to have control of where this data is going and what to do with it. The directive, we don't want the directive to really care. So this uh, feedback, iFeedback impl, kind of like a Java standard, it's an <laughs> interface <laughs> that uh, we just kind of came up with the idea to make this look like an interface. So the user of this directive passes in a name. We just happen to name it feedback with a capital F, which is important. We could have named this anything, but this turns out to be the name of a factory that uh, it's the responsibility of the controller, whoever's using this directive, to create. They could create any factory they want. Um, this, could be used, this could be used all over the place, and each of them could use their own factory. And basically, this factory has to conform to the interface that the directive has defined. So it needs to have a send function that accepts a message and a Boolean, whether it's anonymous or not. And I don't think we put that in our interface definition, but it actually needs to return a promise, too. You'll see down here that eventually this feedback factory is called, the send is called, and we then deal with the return promise to know what happened. So that's kind of, we defined that it has to have an interface implemented, and then the user of this directive can, can decide what the heck they want to do with it. We end up just posting it with, with Ajax to the server, but potentially you could do anything. Now, the main reason why we went this route, oh, let me just point out how, how we did that. So we're passing in the name of a factory. To actually go and get that factory, we have to use the injector. This is the Angular injector. And we say get, and we look at this iFeedback impl attribute that's on the scope. And uh, we go and get that actual feedback factory, and now we have an object that we can do something with. So the alternative to this um, which we explored first was the caller can just pass a function. So this could be, um, you know, on submit and equals, and then in parentheses you say my feedback function, and it's going to accept an object or something with some data. So the downside to that is that when you implement the directive, you had to when you're when you invoke that function, you would have then a scope dot on submit. So you would have scope.onSubmit and you call that function and it, it looks like a function call. Well, Angular is doing some magic and the data that actually goes from your function call to this function in your controller is being wired up and it was not clear in the least bit how that happened. We've learned since then kind of how it works and, and how Angular is doing it but it just wasn't clean. It wasn't clear. It was, it was too magic. And um, so we said, we want something that's a lot more clear. And if I look at this, I can know, I can know exactly what's happening um, when this feedback is submitted. So that's why we went this route. Um, we'd love your feedback <laughs> on uh, if you've, you've done something like this in another way. The main, the main problem we're solving is getting data from a directive, the data that the directive has collected, back to the, the caller of that directive user of that directive. So this was a, our solution for it. We have an example later where we didn't follow this pattern and we used the function call instead. Yeah. So <laughs> by using this attribute and passing in the name of the service, you in a sense create a service agnostic directive is what you're attempting yeah. to do here? Okay. Absolutely. That's, that's it. Yep. We want the, the directive to just post it somewhere and whoever is using the directive can decide how to, how to deal with that. Yeah. Like locally, I think we might send a Bitbucket, for example, is one of the, the reasons that we talked about doing this is that, you know, if we're running locally on our grub server, we would just not do anything or something like that was a conversation point. We ended up using Node.js and doing it at a different point, but. Okay, we go to the next one. All right, so another example of a directive that, um, we've used to help us out, Matt mentioned, to do alerts. So the problem we want to solve is putting a bootstrap alert just anywhere on anywhere in our entire app and to make it really simple. So also solving the problem of maybe I'm on the add user page and when that add user has finished, I want it to actually put a message on the manage users page because once I click the save button, it directs me back to 
my manage users page and I want the alert to show on that page. So I need, it's cross page talk and I need my add user page to be able to say put a message over here. So I call it manage bootstrap alerts. There actually is a bootstrap um, Angular directives to, to do alerts and interestingly our directive ends up using the, the bootstrap um, directive as well. But uh, if we if we simply use theirs, we, you would have to put it everywhere on the page that you wanted an alert. You'd have to manually insert it. So <clears throat> what we've done is any any page that wants to register for alerts that can be added to that page simply adds this little div, and this is going to end up just dropping an alerts in wherever you have that div. And we've made it so that we have some cool logic that can. Say you've added uh, a particular alert multiple times, it'll show like a number on there, two, three, four, five, a counter of how many times that alert's repeated. If there are other alerts, they'll start stacking and we could define all kinds of behavior there, but this is all you have to drop on the page. And then to add a alert to this particular page, so we're on the add user page, for example. Um, where did I put my, oh, down here. In, your, in any controller, you can just grab the page alerts factory and say add. You give it some parameters, what type is it going to be, what message you're going to put on the alert. A timeout would, would say after a medium amount of time, then make the alert automatically go away. Lots of configurable stuff there. And um, you can also specify a path. This particular example I grabbed didn't have it, but a path would say which page or which route technically you want that alert to show up on, and and it'll go there. Um, by not specifying a route, then we have it defaulting to the page you're currently on. So it's just a really handy way to, to throw an alert on a particular page with a bunch of information and uh, configuration. Um, as far as the, the code goes, this is the, this this directive here is up top. And all it does is it registers this page. So we're getting the, the location.path. So that's this page's route. And we're registering it to in our page alerts factory so that later when page alerts.add is called, it knows what, what page it's going to add it to. Um, the, the page alerts is keeping track of all of the pages that have registered um, to have alerts displayed on them. And then this uh, allows us to, to do a template. So this example doesn't have a template, it just has a simple message. You could pass in a template, kind of like directives themselves use templates. You can say, here's some template HTML code, and here's here's some data to bind to that code. So you can have ng models and ng bindings inside your alert. You can have really dynamic alert data. And that's what this sets up for us. We had to use uh, the compile provider to be able to compile templates and use the scope that's passed in to get the data. So turned out to be a really useful way to get um, powerful alerts anywhere throughout the whole system. One other quick thing is notice the scope on the top there, the isolate scope. We just explicitly set empty, again, for that same reason of, of making sure that the, it's not automatically getting its parent scope. Yep, so when you do stuff like this, we aren't muddying somebody else's scope potentially overriding data or who knows what. Okay. Do you want to talk about this one? Or? <laughs> on Do you want me to? You're on a roll. You're doing great. <laughs> I'm videotaping now, so. Okay. <laughs> You're doing a good job. Thanks. Okay. So um, we, we talked about this one. Matt talked about it a little bit. This is to be able to disable a form on submit, and we just wanted it to happen everywhere in the system, not have to think about it. Uh, so we created a HP disable on submit directive, and this is all that would need to be added to any form to get this behavior. This is yet another directive, I think is on the next slide even. Uh, so you add that. This is telling it um, when this form is submitted, here's the, the function that I want to call back. So we did this instead of the ng submit directive. Uh, you may have, you may use that already. So we took off our ng submits and changed it to HP disable on submit. It does what ng submit does, plus disables things. So the real uh, the, the real additive here 
is that we're using transclude, so we're grabbing everything that's inside the form, we're transcluding it to go inside, where's our template? Our template has a field set, and then everything that was transcluded goes inside this field set. So you end up with, <coughs> our original HTML just had a form and then the stuff. Now we have a form, a field set, and the stuff. We're just wrapping everything with the field set. That field set then has an ng disable property that uh, knows when to disable this form. Most browsers support the field set disable property and it, they disable the form. I think we found IE8 and older don't. And since we've stopped supporting IE8, then we're good. <laughs> so, uh, so we end up being able to very easily disable the form. Uh, can you maybe explain transclude for people who don't understand what transclude is? Because it's kind absolutely. of made up before Angular. Yeah. It. Yeah, absolutely. So transclude means we've got this is our element with the directive on it, right? We want to transclude everything inside this, meaning take all the content inside here and put it somewhere else. And in your template, this is a really, really simple template because it's just one, one element. But say you could have a bigger template with divs, inputs, of forms, whatever you want. Somewhere inside your template, you throw on this ng transclude attribute, which is a directive itself. Angular finds that and it says, all of the content that was inside this element, throw it where I told you to put it. So if I've got some big huge template, it's gonna slap that big huge template in here and take all the content that was there and drop it in where I put that ng transclude attribute. Thanks. Yeah. Any other comments about this one? Okay. Notice that we didn't uh, um, isolate the scope here. It's true. Why didn't we do that? Um, we probably hooked into the default behavior for form for Angular. <coughs> Since we're already using a form in the system, we just piggyback on the current behavior of form rather than wrapping in another scope. So this was kind of cool. Um, we wanted to use Bootstrap's um, invalid. I guess they, they have a class that says has error. And you can get um, your input as well as labels. And if you have like uh, some help text or something, uh, error text, all of that can be marked with the error. Or I think you can do infos or warnings and all kinds of stuff. But we wanted to use the has error from Bootstrap. Angular doesn't play real well with that because if you have an invalid input, the only thing that gets marked as invalid is the input itself. So here's our input element. It gets a ng invalid, and then here's the reason why it's invalid. And so we could style off of that. You know, we could go and make the input have a red border, but we don't get Bootstrap's all of Bootstrap's functionality to to style the whole form group. So <clears throat> we wrote this directive. Uh, it's actually a combination of two. So we're targeting our input, and it's requiring the, uh, it says optional, and then the caret says apparent. It's requiring that apparent uh, element is the form group directive. And that allows us to pass in form group's controller so we can have access to it. What this does then is the directive on input really isn't doing much except for watching we have a watch on our ng-valid um, status. So when the input's ng-valid status changes, this function's gonna get fired, and we call on this form group controller, we're actually calling this method set validity and we're passing in whether it's valid or not valid, so toggling this. Up here, what we're toggling then is we're adding a class HP valid or HP invalid and vice versa, toggling that back and forth. Now we have something on our form group that we can style. So now we're styling HP invalid with bootstraps, um, error status, and we get all everything that goes along with it. That's a cool example of how two directives can interact with each other. Um, my understanding of when to use a controller and, and versus a link, 
um, what they say in the Angular documentation is a controller is you're exposing an API, if you want to think of it that way. So this directive needs the API of that directive, and so by requiring it, you're getting that, that directive's controller that you can then call functions on. And so typically in a controller, you're going to say this dot something, and you're, you're setting an, an API on that controller that somebody else can now require and, and make calls on. One of the other keys and why we have form group be optional here is this goes for every input in the system, whether or not it has a parent that has a form group. So if you have another input somewhere else, if you don't have it as an optional, you're going to get in your errors, which is no good. Oh, good. Uh, yeah, let's point out this uh, priority negative 1,000. That's really up to this. Uh, Angular, you can, you can have all kinds of directives on, on the same element, on the same class, or on the same attribute. And uh, Angular decides which one to run first based on the priority you specify here. We arbitrarily chose negative 1,000 as a bottom last priority ever just because we don't care that this runs before anybody else. We just want it to run sometime. So uh, we figured it would run eventually <laughs> and wouldn't block anybody else. <coughs> Did it ever cause you any problems without that? No. I think this was future thinking. You know, I don't think we have any other directives targeting inputs right now. Well, we have the null, yeah, the null one. The next slide. Page. <laughs> okay. Maybe so, maybe speaking of which, problem. we have one more. <laughs> oh, then we did the same we also have negative one thousand. I guess we could have. We could but we don't. Ma we don't modify the DOM on either of these directives, and that's where the key probably comes in. If you're going to be modifying the DOM or something like that, is what you know, probably might be more important. Ben, you could probably talk about this one better. Ben wrote this one. Uh, we had Don't throw me under the bus. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do my best. I fixed the defect. <laughs> what? No, there's no defect. <laughs> so, so we found that uh, on an input, you know, if you, your page first loads and you have empty inputs, right? Because the user needs to fill it out. So originally, the, the ng model that that input is bound to is, is null empty, nothing's been entered in, and, and that works well for us. The user goes and type something in, and then they change their mind and backspace all the way and delete it all. What does Angular do? They decide to put it as an empty string because, you know, they had set it as a string and now they just deleted everything. And now we have an empty string on our model, and server-side code that we have written and been using for a while doesn't like that. We want null to mean that this was explicitly left empty, and that's okay. An empty string doesn't pass our validation and is not okay. So we wrote an input, Ben wrote an input, or a directive to um, turn empty strings, empty inputs, into nulls. So that it, when it gets bound to our model, it turns out to be a null. I'll but you can, can also, to be clear, with the newer version of Angular, you can, on the input, put ng-trim attribute on each element that you want this on. But we didn't want to find every input in our system and put ng trim on there because we have lots of inputs and I'm, I'm going to be modifying the code one day and I'm not going to forget to do it. So we wanted a programmatic way to, to change that behavior and Angular doesn't support that right now. Could you also just check for is dirty or is pristine? No, because when we do our, our submit um, on, on the form, we just we would be pushing a bunch of logic in there, and we wouldn't know whether or not we want it to necessarily be an empty string or null, depending on the situation. So uh, we would be pushing a lot of logic into our controllers on our submit functions. Uh, yeah, you can figure out whether this particular directive works for you, but the, the learning is what we're doing here, and you can apply it to lots of different situations. Once again, we have two directives working in tandem, so this directive really is on the form, so we have HP empty inputs as null, and that says all of the inputs inside this form should um, set an empty input as null instead of uh, an empty string. And then we're targeting all inputs in the system once again, but we're really saying only apply this directive if it's a child of that parent form group. So that's all this is here for, is just only apply this one if that directive's around. So we didn't have to go find every input in the system and, and put something on them. Now here we're using, this is just a validation to make sure that uh, we're actually on, on a, a form that has that directive. 
but here's the real work. We're using parsers, um, which is some cool functionality that you can um, read, read the values be that's going between the view and the model. So Angular keeps track of view values and model values and passes them back and forth. As models change, it updates the view and vice versa. Parsers allows you to intercept that, so as, a, as the user types something in the view, you can, we're actually unshifting, so we're adding to this parsers array a new function. So it's saying, these are a chain of functions. It runs all of the functions in the array and allows us to, to do stuff with it. So you can either, um, what you return is what go, keeps getting passed down the chain and eventually you could modify the value. You could simply um, leave the value as is, but you can do other logic here if you wanted. What we're doing is we're checking if the input value is an empty string, and if it is, we're returning null. Otherwise, we're just returning it as is. And so when it goes from the view to the model, it, it gets uh, transformed to null. Okay. I believe that's it. So, so any other questions or comments? Well, you guys are doing some cool stuff with uh, directed to directed communication. Yeah, it's really helped solve some problems. Yeah, mm -hmm. and you guys, you guys got rid of IEA support. Yeah, yeah, that was a happy day. <laughs> what do you think? What's the cost of supporting IEA for an Angular application? Your sanity. <laughs> <laughs> Firstborn child. Yeah. <laughs> but a lot of problems that we had were, you know, we could we could write our code to conform to IEA, but as soon as we want to use a third party, you know, open source, you know, power component, we ran into lots of problems. Okay. We just ran it, and so we a lot of times we just have to move whatever that was in house and re redo it. Yeah. Um, because because of how our situation is, it's difficult for us to submit back into and do pull requests to, to GitHub to fix IE8 specific issues. Yeah. Um, so a lot of times we would have to fix it in our code or hack it in, or sometimes we found that it was just written in such a way that we couldn't make any changes and on top of their directives or anything to fix it, we had to solve it a different way, so. Okay, thank you. I'm looking on my screen. <laughs> I didn't realize it was So, Jeremy, yeah, do you want to maybe introduce yourself a little bit and yeah, then yeah. jump to the content of the right? Yep, yep. Um, so, yeah, I'm Jeremy Zare. Um, I do currently, right now, I'm doing freelance web dev stuff. Um, kind of been on my own doing it for quite a few years now, but um, Angular JS actually started doing it with my, my own startup that I'm doing on my own time that I'm not doing freelance stuff with. Um, so, and the, the startup of mine is a um, pretty big data-driven type, um, trying to help affiliate marketers do sort of automation type stuff um, and analyzing their sales and finding offers and things. So, um, I have a whole layer of like tracking clicks, impressions, sales, bringing everything together and then having a reporting dashboard. So that's a pretty significant part of the application as a network business owner trying to figure out. So, um, you know, when you're looking at doing charts and things, um, you know, a lot of, you can use Google Charts, which I actually really like a lot, but if you're gonna do that, you have, all your code is posted on their um, servers. Um, the data isn't sent, but the code is. So, um, once D3 came around, how many of you guys have used that D3? Yes, before, I know you guys. So, um, I thought it was like, one of the next, I mean, open source revolutionizes the game for pretty much all of us, right? Um, but having D3 was like, finally to me, like, hey, I can do all this stuff myself. I can get rid of Google Charts, and I can start using D3 and actually make my own nice looking charts that don't suck, and they're not Flash, which is kind of another whole thing, right? So, <clears throat> so I wanted to kind of just discuss um, how you would use AngularJS, making directives, using D3, um, to create some charts. And there's there's some other libraries and stuff out there that you can use. Um, people have tried to sort of solve the problem. This isn't really like me proposing like some big open source project today. It's just showing 
sort of how you might approach to tackle that type of problem. Um, so, um, so really just using D3 to create data visualization stuff. Um, and I have the full code, and it's actually an app that's up on, on GitHub in the public repo, um, so you can bring it down and, and do it. And I have a demo page um, that you can view if you want to view along as we're talking. But um, I'm just going to make a column chart and a line chart. This is D3. Um, make the chart just the very least bit interactive, just to kind of show how to do that. Um, but And then also, Having the data model, so you get the data from the server, that's in some data model, and then you have a data model that your chart needs to, to be able to run. So kind of showing how to how to handle all that efficiently um, and to make it so it's not a bear to maintain. Um, and yeah, using that transformation, doing that transformation sort of thing. You don't need to do with it. Mm -hmm. Last slides or you're good? No, that's fine. I'll be all right. Um, so really the challenge is when you're trying to make heavy data driven um, um, directives is that to ha it's it's all about the interface. It's about how easy is it for somebody to use, how easy to understand what kind of pieces of data they can override, um, and having that data in a in a structured way as you're transforming it around and, and shoving it in and actually having um, a data model that the that your directive transforms into a chart. Um, and there is a big challenge in um, you have your domain data models and then transforming them into models that are chart compatible models. Because you know we don't want to design coupling between the data that we're getting getting off the server and the data that my that my chart happens to, to need. So if I have a chart, it takes an X Y, but my data on the server is about a basketball player and their points and assists. I don't. I'm not going to fetch off the server and have something that says X Y. I want points and assists and the player's name. And I'm going to translate that into a form that goes on the chart. So that's um, to me in doing a lot of stuff with um, both in my freelancing and my my own um, work, it's, that is usually the biggest problem of just maintaining that big chunk of data, moving it around and, and throwing it to where it needs to. Um, and then also sort of talking about the, how to make the directive, um, and I'm glad everybody, I was the last presenter today, because like everybody sort of touched on a little bit of some of the things that I'm going to talk about too. Um, as far as like having a link function in your directive that just keeps growing and growing and growing and growing. Um, well, when you're doing uh, charts with D3, you got a lot of code, and it's almost all JavaScript. It's like no, no HTML and templates and stuff. So, having a, an effective way to have a, a directive that isn't so hard to look at and read, and but factoring out that um, that code that's doing the work, so you can start doing inheritance and things like that with um, some core charting type objects. <coughs> so the code for this is out there. Um, it's just public, and then um, I have a live demo of that same code working on my site. Um, I just wanted to show it real quick, um, just to pull this over. Got my monitor set up. Sorry about that. Uh, it means. Ah. So <laughs> that's right. It's on roll. Um, so this is the demo of the app. Um, this is just off localhost right now, but it also is up on my, um, on my website. Um, so it's just a scorebook, pretty simple. Um, there's three games, and this is basketball, but I'm only showing scores for four players because uh, a demo would shouldn't make real world sense, I guess. Um, so three games against Tech State and College, and stats, points, and assists. Um, you know, four players and so the first one is just showing points by player. I can switch the game. And something that's also interesting in the code, I wanted to do this back endless. So it's not something I'm going to talk about in the presentation much, but um, if you're interested in learning how to mock um, HTTP backend um, so that you don't have to change your code, um, I have an example. So you can still call your services that do HTTP calls. But then I have a, you know, the when gets and stuff to actually capture the, the endpoints and then return data so they don't have to actually get the server. It's kind of nice. Uh, I hadn't had to do that before. So, and then clicking on a stat on a player will bring up their individual stats um, down below. So to me, this was an important thing to show was just 
how how you would do two charts together and sort of have the interaction, how you would handle the on click, you know, is it a you know something you have to go down in, into the directive, how do you make a nice interface? You could give them the option to choose, you know, like maybe there's some goofy parameter that you're gonna change and nobody's ever thought of changing it. So digging into the directive and changing the, the equal sign or the, the amperage the at sign to a, a equal sign, you could have a parameter that does it. So so I like this. Um, but I also sometimes don't like the sort of freewheeling some some JSON in a configuration object because you, you could misspell something and not totally know it. Um, so what I what I wanted to show is is actually creating a column chart option. So I have a column chart as the name of the directive, um, and then instead of having just passing a straight straight JSON that you know if there's certain attributes you don't define they're going to be defaulted. Uh, instead sort of have it so it's managed. So if you went and you wanted to see what the defaults ended up being, you just dump your object. Whereas if you just pass a, just a structure in, maybe you define three things in, in a, your configuration, how are you gonna find what the actual defaults were that they set up for you if there's not good documentation? I know you always hope there's good documentation, but maybe not, right? So, so sort of just a, um, you know, I like, I like the one single option. Um, putting it in and then that's something on my scope, just creating a new object and then passing it. And then um, you kind of also notice the interface for you know, when somebody clicks a bar or clicks, a, clicks the column, or clicks on one of the items, you have your callback right there so you don't have to worry about digging in um, you know, and trying to override the directive. So the, the goal is really make that directive completely self-sufficient. You know, write, write it once and then never have to modify it again. If you give it enough options, you know, it should be good, right? So, so I'm creating a column chart, and I'm creating a line chart. They're like the same thing. They're a two-dimensional chart. They just have an X, Y. So I was like, man, I'm gonna Google directive inheritance. This has <laughs> gotta be a good thing, right? <laughs> so, so I go and Google it, right? And we all end up on Stack Overflow. Um, it's just, it doesn't need to be done. It can, but realize that that directive has an API. You know, it has the link function, it has the restrict. So when you're actually gonna do some inheritance on the directive itself, it doesn't feel right to me. So a better, a better alternative um, that also achieves some of the other goals that we've talked about of making the link function not really contain, you know, just a ton of code, um, you can factor, so, so the D3 stuff, it's just a ton of JavaScript. Um, so you can factor that out into a separate, a separate object and I, I factored it out to an object that just has a render method. So in your link function, you do a little bit of stuff, and then you call the render on your, on your I called it a view object, so it's like a column chart view object. Um, so then you've already, you've pulled that stuff out, so now you can deal with, okay, the column chart and the line chart are like, you know, 90% similar, so then you can create a base, you know, a base class to inherit from. So let's actually look at some code. So yeah, so still directive inheritance, but you know, man, where's my code going? Open up my Firefox, come on now. <laughs> let's not do that. So here's the directive. Um, it's probably not big enough. Can you guys see that mostly? Let's just see. There. All right. So column chart directive. Here's my link function right at the top. Um, really, all I do is I, I look at that flag. Do I want to watch the data? Do I want to change the chart when my data changes? Um, in my case, in my controller, I actually want to. Um, so just grab the data on that on that object, um, 
and then render chart. So either way, it's just rendering chart. And this is a pretty, pretty simple, easy function. Um, create a new column chart view, and then render it. Um, pass the data, pass that options object, and then the element that the link function actually um, is attached to, send it. So, so you know, this to me, this achieves the goal of, you know, it's keeping keeping the link function just doing, sort of being a being a thin. You know, I don't want to have to, you know, have a ton of code in there. Um, it's easier to, probably easier.